and long summer. Oh, sorry. Got it. Yeah, now welcome everybody. I'd like to uh, start today's meeting by maybe the introduction of guests. I see a few people uh, that are on here. Maybe you can start with, there's an iPhone. If you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, hey, this is Chris with GAT uh, Southwestern United. Sorry about that. No, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Takahiro. See a Takahiro on my screen. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, yep, Takahiro here with uh, Horizon. Oh, welcome. And we have Odette. Hi, Odette, OP from um, Eugene Airport. Well, welcome everyone. And I think everybody else on here is, a, uh, is on the committee. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Catherine for the director's report. Thank you, Patrick. And I will just also note that Matt Rodriguez, uh, our public works director has joined us as well. And go through the list here, okay. All right. Well, hi, everybody. I hope you're doing well. And let's see. Okay. Are you all seeing the main screen? Okay. Very good. All right. Well, we are going to um, work through the activity report. Uh, the financial report, um, and actually Patricia has um, put together a little uh, additional information at the request of Andy Labora today on our capital improvement plan and our cash flow analysis. <clears throat> um, I'll give a little update, uh, industry update on what we're still calling COVID recovery plan. We may change the terminology for that since we're uh, pretty much completely back to pre-pandemic numbers at this point. And then our staff presentation today will be um, Patricia Haley, uh, finance and admin. Um, and so I think I've reshuffled this a little bit, but Patricia will figure it out as we go along. Okay, so we will jump right into the September activity report and that is Andrew. All right, hello everyone. So as you can see here on this uh, slide, we've got comparisons based upon our pre-COVID year 2019 and then last year, which is our full COVID year. So looking good across the board, a lot of green ups there. So as you would expect, significantly up across operations, landings, and plane pastures and pastures from last year as we really rebounded in the recovery. And even better is we're seeing strong, stronger numbers than even our pre-COVID numbers. So you can see operations up and air carrier landings both up 13% over pre-COVID. Uh, really just great news there. And plane passengers up 10%. If you had told me that a year ago, I would have said you were crazy. <laughs> so I am um, ecstatic to see that number. And total passengers overall right there at, at 9%. So really strong numbers for Eugene. We're really doing well. If you pit us against uh, national averages and, and uh, even regional averages, we're, we're doing really well. It, what, you know, everything we've been doing has led us to this place. So uh, yeah, kudos to the whole EUG team. Um, so our load factors. So this is uh, uh, something that's really important to airlines. It's how they go, hey, is this particular flight doing well or not? It's all based on load factor. How many, what percentage of people are in each flight? So you can see 25% up from 2020, but overall we're about eight points down. That's not terrible. We're still in a re rebound kind of status and we've got some new airlines in the market. So that's gonna naturally drag that number down in the short term. Um, I think Avilo especially is um, still getting their legs underneath them and, and getting people on those flights to Burbank. Um, I, I, some of our major carriers, they're, they're doing pretty well. They're above that 73% for sure. I'm hoping that number comes up. I'm thinking that's a short-term blip. So uh, as long as we see that number slowly start to come up, I don't think it's something to worry about. Um, then we see our market shares. They're kind of right-sizing a little bit. I mean, for a while there, Alaska was really uh, the market share leader um, where traditionally it's been United. So now we're seeing United kind of retake that, that market share. 
and we're seeing Southwest coming in strong. I mean, they've only been um, operational for about a month and they're already a 14% share. So that shows you that uh, they're off to a good start they're, and I'm sure they're happy about that. Um, and then air cargo, you know, it's been an up down, right? We've had the increase of air cargo with the Amazon and the FedEx and all that, but then we've lost out, as I think I've mentioned before, we've lost out a lot of that outgoing cargo, which is a lot of the mushrooms and food perishable items that go out to nationwide to restaurants. So we're about 3% down, so it's coming back. I, it's hard to say um, if that's a right sizing as far as maybe we're starting to see some increase on the outflow, um, but we're, we're definitely up from where we were last year with, with uh, the COVID numbers. All right, thanks, Andrew. Any questions on the activity report? And you'll need to unmute and uh, speak up because I'm not gonna be able to see you. Sounds like we're a no. Okay. All right, we'll move on to the September financial report, um, which I know this is an ice cream, but Patricia will walk us through this. Okay, um, what you're gonna see here does not correspond with the passenger numbers and everything being up. We've had a bit of a lag in our airline billing as folks are moving around and we're changing positions on ticket counters and new office space. So we're getting all the exhibits updated and the billing will catch up in the next mm -hmm. month or so. So currently our revenues are 29% under what we budgeted. Um, we're now switching to our CRISA grant from our CARES grant. We've collected all that we wanted to on CARES for our, our operations and maintenance and now we're moving to the CRISA grant. So there's been a little bit of a lag in getting that approval going also. So you'll see the bottom line is a negative, but we did get that uh, approval uh, about a week ago. So um, the bottom line is much better than what it looks because we did get that Chris of money. Uh, personnel is 17% under, under budget and 2% above last year. We did add, um, add some positions this year, as you'll remember, the financial compliance officer and the curb monitors. Uh, materials and supplies is under budget 32% and 5% below last year. The capital purchase is a new John Deere uh, utility tractor for the airfield services. It replaced an old one that was way past its useful life. We ordered it earlier. It just was received. It's been on backlog for quite some time. CSA, it chugs along at 1 12th every month. It's always right on target. So our total operating expense is 19% under budget and 3% under last year. And as you see, there's a negative, but like I explained, there's a CRISA reimbursement and also some airline billings that will hit in October and correct this. Great. All right, our interesting graphs. So as you can see, we've got a comparative of 18 and 19, 20 and 21 and 22 there. Um, you can see we're, we're coming back in our revenue strong, the, the uh, yellow lines, they're coming back really strong. When we correct in October, you're gonna see a big spike there in next month's revenue. These are just kind of fun to sit and look at over time. You can <laughs> just grab so much information from them. And then our expenses, you can see our expenses kind of mirroring last year. It's up a bit, but holding steady. And our cumulative net gain. So we're down just slightly, but that's because that uh, that revenue hasn't come in yet from the airlines and also the CRISA. And you'll see it. Well, this is without care. So when that airline revenue comes in in October, you'll see that yellow line bump up considerably. And the same here with the CARES Act. We're going to correct that next month. So it says CRISA. It'll, it'll come dramatically up because we did over a million dollar draw. So those two graphs are going to change. Okay, thanks, Patricia. And we're going to come back to you in a minute for more financial info. Any questions on the September financial report? And again, speak up because I'm not going to be able to hear you or see you. Raise your hand. Okay, well, I've got um, just a couple of slides here on uh, pandemic recovery that I thought were really interesting. Um, 
So we typically do a 10 up, 10 down comparison. So airports uh, that are uh, 10 of similar size, but 10 larger and 10 smaller. And we um, benchmark ourselves against these airports. So I pulled out Medford and Redmond um, separately, but then I also looked at the anomalies. So what we're looking at here is the airport recovery as far as passengers and load factor. So if, and these are from um, July and actually, these are all July. So even the lower one where it says May, that should say July actually, didn't get that changed. Um, so we're looking at July uh, comparisons. So you can see um, for July and Eugene, we had um, a pretty big change over uh, 2020 as far as passenger numbers. The load factor for July 2021 20, was 87%, so really healthy. And that's comparing to a load factor of 58% back in July of 2020. I'm just trying to minimize the screen here. Um, and then the 2019 load factor, which is really what the true comparison should be. I'm kind of using 2020 as a uh, throwaway year because it was so wildly um, volatile. Um, so if you see that, you can see that our load factor has returned actually to a stronger position um, in July of 2021. And our passenger increase um, was just about 1%, so really flat, but it was still um, up in the positive. And there were only four airports in our 10 up, 10 down uh, that showed an increase. Um, and so if you look at Redmond and Medford, they, um, they have been tracking more similarly to us, but uh, they both have not recovered fully as of July on their passenger numbers. And then um, the other airports that actually did see uh, improvements in their, uh, on the positive side for their airports is um, Jackson Hole. At the bottom there, you see 34%. Um, so they, uh, huge leisure market. So I think they did really, really well at this summer. And then uh, Wilmington, uh, North Carolina is ILM. And that uh, they are up 4%. Um, I'm not too familiar with that market, so I don't know if it's a big leisure market, but I would assume that that was a bump up from leisure. <clears throat> and then um, the South Dakota, uh, Sioux City, South Dakota is FSD. And then you could see that they were up by 0.1%. So overall, uh, we are definitely the strongest among all of these 20 airports, um, which I thought was at least worth a note. Okay, and then in our forward-looking schedule, um, taking a look for October, uh, you see we have our departures are up 4% and our seat capacity is up 17%. So that's pretty strong. That's what's driving you know, our passenger numbers being back up to 2019 numbers. And then looking forward to February, uh, and again, I always say that these are always subject to change because the airlines are continuing to make changes in their schedules. But as of right now, in February, we will be up 8% 8, 8 in departures and 29% in seat capacity. So I anticipate some of that will, um, will change a little bit, but that is especially for um, January, February, when those are really kind of our slower months, that's really strong to see that seat capacity coming back. And then um, another thing I've really been keeping an eye on is from my friend, uh, Bill Swellbar, who is with the Swellbar Jean Consultancy. Um, and so he, sent, he sends out um, industry thoughts and predictions and he's, uh, from my experience, he's always really, really accurate. So I really pay attention to what he has to say. Um, and so just recently he put out um, some interesting things to be keeping an eye on. Um, so of course the biggest cost centers for airlines are labor and fuel. Um, somewhat you can control labor, fuel, pretty much not. Um, so last week uh, he noted that a barrel of oil traded at a high of $81.50, which was a seven year high. Um, and then at the same time, the pilot shortage is back with a vengeance. 
Uh, airlines are trying desperately to retain their pilots and gain new pilots, and they're offering pretty hefty bonuses to uh, get uh, pilots to either come on to uh, fly for them or to retain the pilots that they have so that they don't, you know, if they're a regional carrier, then they don't go on to um, one of the larger carriers like a Delta or United or American. Um, so you can see there kind of what was offered recently to some pilots at a uh, regional carrier PSA. Um, and then he always throws in a little note, it says the industry is a pattern bargainer despite the economics, because you know, you look at that and the math doesn't work very well there. So what he is saying is the equation right now is looking like, you know, 2021 20, pilot wages having to be up to be able to retain them, plus expensive uh, aero, uh, oil prices it potentially can equal less community air service. Um, so he is uh, talking specifically about the 50 seat um, regional aircraft that for the most part, we don't have in our market any longer. However, uh, we do have um, United Airlines flying quite a few uh, CRJ 200s, which is the 50 seater. So that could be a bit of a concern moving forward. And we wanna make sure and keep an eye on that. I know this is a really big eye chart as well, but I wanted to note here, um, another part of um, what he put out recently in his October report is taking a look at international passengers that are traveling through small and not have airports. So if you take a look at um, the carrier gateway airport pairs, we're actually sitting pretty well. We have um, a DFW on American, We've Technically, we still have Chicago on United, even though they aren't flying it currently, but it remains in the schedule. Um, we have Denver on United, and we've got, let's see, there's one more, uh, Seattle on Alaska, and Phoenix on American, and Delta, Salt Lake City. So we, we actually have quite a few of these connecting airports for international travel, which puts us in a better position than many other small airports uh, without that much large hub connectivity. And so here is just a snapshot of our international passengers and the destinations they uh, travel to the most. So you can see lots of Mexico, lots of Canada, um, and then some other routes thrown in there, Costa Rica, Germany, Japan, Korea, um, and New Zealand. I thought that was interesting. Um, and so we actually, right now, we retain uh, overall 46% of our international travelers. Of our top 15 international markets, we retain 47%. So considering we're not an international airport, but uh, yet that many um, of our passengers are who are traveling internationally or continuing to use their local airport, that is a positive. Okay, any questions on the air service side of things? All right, I will hop into the general aviation comparison then. Um, and this one, so Randy puts this together for us, which is really useful. Um, we've been trying to make some sense over uh, of this and some of it has to do with um, private leisure travel on general aviation aircraft. Some of it has to do with weather, um, how, uh, you know, if, if the region is having good flying weather or not. Um, so you can kind of see the comparison there with uh, 2021 being on the right hand side and comparing to 2020 in the orange and 2019 in the blue. Um, and just kind of the trajectory we've been on there. You know, local traffic and then of course itinerant traffic which is coming uh, from outside of your airport into your airport. All right, any questions on that? Okay, I'm just gonna go through the construction report real quick so that we make sure and get to Patricia's presentation next. Um, and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm on my smaller screen today, so I get to do this from memory since I don't have the notes uh, popping up on the same screen. So that's handy. Um, but on the left, you can see our new configuration for uh, taxiway uh, Bravo 2. So the rehab of the secondary runway is complete. Um, it went very well on schedule. 
it no longer has a dip um, <laughs> on the one end, which is uh, probably a big welcome relief for many uh, general aviation pilots, especially. And then we realigned that um, taxiway Bravo 2 so that it's offset from Charlie, um, which was bringing it into FAA standard. And then again, this project was 100% funded through Airport Improvement Program uh, funds this year, which was a huge, um, we, we just lucked out on the, the AIP schedule because this pro, uh, project had quite a lot of discretionary funding and entitlement funding. It was to have a large chunk of um, airport match, but then we didn't wind up having to do the match. So that was, that was really good. And then on the, the picture on the right, you can just see that beautiful new smooth asphalt and bright new uh, paint lines. So it's looking pretty good. And then I'll try and go from memory and Andrew, I might need some help with uh, remembering all the projects. So our um, check bag screening machine, uh, the fifth machine that will go in behind the Southwest Airlines uh, ticket counter, that has gone to bid. And I believe we opened bids on November 17th. Um, and we understand that that machine is ready to go as soon as we're ready to uh, plug and play. Um, it will be a regular size machine. We'd really wanted to put in uh, the extra large machine to be able to handle golf clubs. Um, but when we got in there, we realized uh, the entire brains um, and all of the infrastructure were in that node on the back wall that would then have to be pushed out to be able to accommodate the larger machine. So it was going to be more than a million dollars to be able to um, make that change instead of having pretty much a plug and play situation with a machine that would go directly into the infrastructure that's already there. So um, we just uh, bit the bullet and we're going forward with just getting a, a machine as fast as we can. And Southwest Airlines also wants the machine as fast as we can get it. Um, and then of course, you know, knowing that we'll be um, moving towards uh, Concourse C and expansion of the ticket counter areas in the um, back airline offices, and then hopefully putting a fully in line baggage system in a few years. Uh, we wanted to just be smart about how we were spending our money in that area. The, um, the under A gate space that had been built out for Southwest Airlines and they, they used a portion of it. And then American came in and said that they wanted the rest of it. So that build out is just about complete now. Um, and they will be moving into that space as well. It's quite a lot more space for American uh, than the, what they have had previously. So uh, I have a feeling American has some plans. And so we'll be interested to hear what those are going to be coming up. Um, let's see. The parking lot expansion um, to try and accommodate our wildly fluctuating parking situation. Um, those plans are at 90%. Um, and had, Andrew, do you recall when they're going to bid? Uh, I think they're going to try to go to bid in the spring. Yeah. So that we can start work. I'm, I, we've been talking, Dan and RSNH, we all had a meeting I think just last week. And the plan is to try and, because um, we're anticipating the rains to end early because of La Nina this year. Mm -hmm. So the hope is that we can get in, get some of the demo work done during the rain and then kind of hit a sweet spot where we can start a little bit or more earlier than we would normally as far as getting the parking lot operational. Because as you said, we don't need it every day, but when we do, it's like, oh my gosh, we need it now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, okay, great. Thank you. The mezzanine conference room with the glass enclosure is just about done. I guess we're, it's functional now, but we're waiting on one more piece of glass, but we've already moved it into the public area. And so we're able to utilize that space um, into the future for meetings that uh, will no longer have to be escorting people into that space. Um, we're also going to be meeting with Atlantic Aviation next week for a pre-construction meeting for the new fuel farm um, on the south end of the field. So that's really exciting. That's one of our key uh, enabling projects that we need to get that built so that we can decommission the old fuel farm as part of um, the road realignment to the front of the terminal building is um, in our master plan. And then let's see, the, oh, the car wash project is in the design stage and uh, hopefully we'll be moving that project along 
shortly as well um, to get that built. That will also alleviate some of our parking issues when we're able to get that car wash built, um, decommission the current car wash and recapture those spots for parking. Okay, I will stop the share so that, um, see if there's any questions first of all, and then we'll have Patricia go through her presentation. Hey, Catherine, is America's Hub started their shuttle service back up yet? No, um, you know, unfortunately, so, uh, and they were under uh, hub shuttles, what they, they were using at the airport. They, um, they we, we basically ended that agreement um, with them mutually. And we did put an RFP out for a new shuttle service that was both for a door-to-door -door shuttle and then hopefully an on-demand shuttle for the economy lot. We didn't get any takers on it. So now we've entered into a process with purchasing to talk directly with some of the potential shuttle companies to see if we can get that service back in, most likely just as a door-to-door -door service. Um, it's really key to our student population um, and to some of our lower income folks be able to have that option. So we're really hopeful that we can um, be able to put together some agreement with a company to be able to put that service back in. I think, uh, you know, not getting any takers on that RFP, it's still pretty volatile out there in the industry. And uh, I don't think people are willing to take a chance on it just quite yet. So hopefully soon. Okay, other questions? All right, then Patricia, uh, why don't you take it away? All right, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. All right, this is a quick little overview of airport finances as seen through the rate model. So our rate model has three components. It's got your data variables, which is our central service allocation. That's one of the known elements. Uh, we project out employments per airline and landing weights per airline. The metrics are rentable square space, which is the joint use space for the airlines, the airline rental spaces, office, counter, bag handling, fleet area hold. And then our direct expenses come from us, the fire and safety for our ARF and our uh, police officers, supplemental security, which is operations, uh, the terminal building, administration, marketing, and our other cost centers. From the rate model, it generates our terminal rent rate, which uh, is assigned to the airlines as well as other concessionaires. These are the revenues that we get from the airlines for their office space, baggage makeup, kiosks and antenna, the comm room. It generates a landing fee, and that's where the weights are used. And, and then the joint use fee, security, gate and uh, fees are all from in-plane passengers, and then the jet bridge fee. We also have our non-airline revenue, which as you can see has many components for our, our GA hangers, our FBO, charters. We have some farming leases. We take care of our land out there. Uh, the charter has some landing fees. We got a rental car. Uh, counter rentals, security badging, we get reimbursement uh, for our LEO police officers here, get a little bit back on that. There's storage rental area, parking's a big generator of revenue, ground transportation, the gift shop, the restaurant, a little bit from the ATM, some GSA rent, and just some smaller little things. So the cost center expense is a portion to the individual airlines. We use our rate metrics and our data variables to come up with the rates. And then, as I said before, it's assigned either per landing uh, weight or per square foot or in plane passengers. Our director has the right to adjust our rates uh, to incentivize airlines to participate here at Eugene and and not go elsewhere and keeps our rates down, keeps our passengers flowing through us. 
the rates are negotiated with the airline. We're close to going into negotiations with our airlines again. We've been on a holdover for about a year and a half now. And then the final rates are set through an administrative order. Is that presentation. I'm just going to go right on in to these are our relief grants, and it's, this is how we've planned to use them over the next few years. Our CARES Act has now been this, the operations and maintenance have been fully expended here. We're saving the last 10 million to do the heavy pad construction. Our CRISA, we've assigned to our PCA units. We're going to put new PCA units at all the jet bridges. Uh, to do the mezzanine enclosure, which Catherine talked about. And this is where we're now entering into using the operations and maintenance, which I discussed earlier on the finance side. We've got a little bit for concessionaires. This will come directly to the airport because we've already provided the relief. So it'll just be an offset. Uh, let's see, ARPA. ARPA is coming soon. Our FBO has waited, or our ADO has waited until their new fiscal year. Not all of them have done that, but our, ours chose to. And I just got an email from them today that the, the grant should be coming shortly, and then we can enter into that. Once we expend our uh, CRISA up here, then we'll be moving into expending the ARPA for operations and maintenance for the remainder of fiscal year 23 or 22, and then finishing up in 23. We also got a little bit of ARPA for our concessionaires, which again, will be just, it would be an offset to their rent. Um, this one has a focus on small providers. So this, this will be helping out the smaller providers at all the airports. So by the end of fiscal year 23, we anticipate being done with all of our relief grants. Anyone have any questions on that? Oh, I'm gonna send all these slides out to everybody too. So you'll have all this information, you can look it over. And if you have any questions, just get a hold of me. I'll get right back to you. All right, here is our CIP, and I really apologize. There, that's a little bit better. So a lot of these, you, Catherine's talked to you about. Um, we've completed our economy block crosswalk, which has been great, especially since we lost the shuttle service. Um, our Southwest Airlines build out has been completed. Uh, we did a wheelchair assist equipment for them. Landside parking lot expansions. I think we're gonna move this one up and I just didn't get it corrected on the slide. I think we'll probably do that next year, won't we, Catherine? Uh, let's see, there's some wetland delineation we have to do. Here's the terminal mezzanine glass enclosure. Uh, this is the one that just got completed, 16L34R. That was a large project. There's our fifth TSA screening machine that Catherine talked about, PCA jet units, which I talked about, what we're gonna do with our relief grant. We're gonna do some LED apron lighting improvements, uh, which we will actually get some help from eWeb on that. The Merriman Slough wetland mitigation, we don't know what that will be yet, we're still waiting. Uh, Concourse C terminal improvements, we start doing our environmental here at this point. On course, see, uh, Charlie Mike gets done in 23 and 24. Car wash design and construct, we're going to do that next year. That will be all with CFCs. The terminal planning study is happening starting now, isn't it, Catherine? Uh, yes, that's right. We've had our initial meeting with um, RSNH and then. Uh, they're working on a preliminary stakeholder meeting um, that hopefully we will get that scheduled pretty soon. That's great. So here's our heavy pads, which we're going to use our CARES Act for. And then we've also, uh, we may use some core grant for it. This is going to include a FOTS relocate. So all of the, the problem fiber that we've had out here, we're, we're gonna move it, relocate it so it won't continue to haunt us on every project that we go to do. So the heavy pads will be a combination of the CARES, a little bit of AIP grant, and then we're hoping for that core grant. And that will cover almost all of our local match required there. Uh, then there, we're gonna design and build a new landscaping shop. And you can see that's gonna happen. We'll start the design build in 22 and actually do the build in 23. 
Then we move into um, the air cargo, expanding the air, the shoulders out there on uh, those two. And we're hoping to get a Connect Oregon grant, which would be 1.4 million is what we've put in for, and our match would be about 600,000 for that. That, that grant is going in next week, I believe we submit that. We're gonna demo the old car wash. This will allow for more parking, considerably more parking, and we may be moving that one up too. Then we have a pavement management plan that we need to do. The fuel farm design and build, I guess we can remove that since Atlantic Aviation is doing that. Plan on, let's see, weekend. And then we move into the terminal apron concourse C design and build in 23 and 24 here. And then we realign the road and the roundabout, demo the old tower landscape shopping friendly hangar over here by the administration building. That's got to go before we get into actually doing concourse C and the apron construct in 2025. And we'll rework the ramp and the apron in 26 and 27. There's a lot there. Um, I'll send it out to you. You can sit and look at it. If I do any revisions, I'll send it back out again. Anyone have any? Right. And it's important to, to know, you know, the, the closer in projects, you know, they're either happening or some of them, uh, you know, we're waiting to see if we'll obtain you know, core grant funding or Connectory again grant funding and then the further out the projects go um, you know those are basically just um, noting where we think the project may happen but there's always a little bit of change that happens um, especially you know when we have unexpected events like global pandemics and um, need to make adjustments from there but um, for the most part you know the um, projects over the next three or so years are pretty well laid out for us. Right, and we're working with Landerman Brown and Central Services to identify at what point we'll need to get some financing to move them all forward. So I see in the chat um, a question from Nick James. Nick, thanks so much. I'm glad you're on here today. So Nick James is our uh, Southwest Airlines facilities representative and, and has been a great partner to work with. And yes, don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna build some more ticket counters and airline office space and all of that stuff. So that's further out. Um, so part of our advanced terminal study that we're commissioning right now will uh, detail out exactly what we need to be able to meet our uh, current and future passenger demand. Um, and then more detailed plans will come out of that study. So yes, the, the plan is to, um, it will be part of that whole C concourse. We've just named it C concourse, but that that is part of that whole build out. Let's see. All right, other questions. I have, I have a question. Maybe this is the time for it rather than later in the meeting, since we're talking about capital and the city is looking at other ARPA funds and how to maybe use those in the city. I know the budget committee is going to meet pretty soon to talk about that and prioritize some things. You know, the Chamber of Commerce is working, got a small group working on possible recommendations. Um, are there things on that list that you've just gone over that if we were to be able to get some additional funds could move up that would help accelerate other parts of those projects? Um, and if so, um, is there any? problem with this committee writing a letter of recommendation to the budget committee and council asking for that because it's a big economic development driver if we can move some of these things up. Yeah, and um, so Andy, I would say, I would just first note that we've been really fortunate with the amount of federal relief funding that we've received um, over the past 18 months. So 33 million in all, um, some of that's uh, of small pieces of that is for our concessioner partners, but the vast majority has been uh, going directly in, into our um, budget, um, which helped us 
survived through the pandemic when you know our passenger numbers and revenues have really dropped off. Um, and then now, because we've bounced back so quickly, we're able to um, fund infrastructure projects, capital um, projects with it. Uh, uh, Patricia can tell you it's been a, a little challenging with the FAA because they, they haven't quite known what to do with us because we did we had no debt service. And so many, most airports are using this for their debt service. Um, and then operations. So we had no debt service and we, we bounced back so quickly that then we got, we were in a position where we had money to spend, but we needed to spend it on capital. Um, and so it, it, it took a, a bit for the FAA to um, help us with being able to facilitate using the money in that way. But we're, we're now on that track to be able to do it. Um, so to answer your question, more money is always better. Um, it, it, you know, we know that coming towards the end of fiscal year 23, and I know Patricia, we're trying to really hone this in now because there, there have been a couple of new opportunities that have come up that we didn't expect. Um, the you know, our core grant, we kind of expected, usually we would use the core grant opportunity uh, just to get our local match for a federal um, summer AIP project. But this, uh, this next summer, we didn't. We were carrying forward our AAP. Now, now that that's changed, Patricia, we should probably take another look at that. Um, although our application's already in for core, so yeah. And the, we were going to say something. The amount for that match on the new AIP project that we just identified, two point three million. It's it's only like one hundred fifty four thousand. Yeah. So if we can get the core grant, then we only have to put out like four thousand. And I just also wanted to uh, mention that we're building reserves. We were only at five or six months and we're committed to gradually building those up and the relief grants have really helped us there. Yeah, and that, that's another really good point about our reserves. Um, we'd been, we'd had about a six month reserve but we had a practice of drawing on them and then paying them back. Um, when, and then, you know, really going into this pandemic realized we really need to, have a solid one year uh, reserves that are not touched. Um, and I think our airline partners are in support of that as well. Um, and then the other opportunity that came up recently that we didn't uh, anticipate is being able to participate in Connect Oregon again. So we're putting that grant opportunity together. It has a pretty large match, um, but of course you wanna take every grant opportunity that you can get. So that's, these are part of the variables as we're looking at um, you know, making sure that we're, uh, have, you know, our capital budget uh, is intact and moving forward, but we know probably about the end of fiscal year 22, moving into 23 is when we probably are going to need to see either some additional grant funding or some gap funding of some sort to be able, if we're going to continue to um, build the things that we need to build to accommodate our passenger demand right now um, and, and get us to that point where the enabling projects are mostly done and we're able to then focus on the outcome of the advanced terminal study and what that study shows that we need to build after that. So and that's my roundabout way of answering your question, Andy. Um, you know, I think as an advisory committee, you're advisory to the council. And, um, you know, if you wanted to have those discussions, you could. I would just tell you that we've received quite a lot of, of grant funding. And, um, and so I, I honestly don't know how the budget committee would do that. Uh, one follow up then on the 50 million or whatever is out there for the Concourse C, I mean, is that actually identified uh, in terms of a source at this point, or is that debt service that you're going to take on? Um, and if so, then I think, in, at least in my mind, then maybe you know, some of these funds could then be, and I don't know how long, you, how, how quickly you have to use them, but I mean, if you were able to kind of hold them aside to leverage against bonding or however you're going to, you know, come up with that money, uh, that could be an option as well, it seems like. So the relief funds, um, the Congress and the FA have been very clear, we, we are to spend them expeditiously. Um, so holding on to them is really not an option, um, and that's why we've been really trying to schedule those and spend them. Um, the C concourse build, you know, 
it will definitely have to be um, another funding source. So most likely a bond process. We've been having some discussions with Public Works Finance and Central Finance about what that might look like working both with our airport financial consultants, Landrum and Brown, and then the city's um, financial consultant and bond consultant to figure out the best way to go about that. Um, so those, those discussions are ongoing and um, that's kind of part of uh, the, the tweaking of this uh, capital improvement program and the cost, um, uh, the cost analysis to know exactly where we're at and where we need to where we might need to have grant matches and where we need to, um, you know, schedule these projects really carefully so that, you know, we're getting what we need done done, but not overextending ourselves. Any other questions around that? Any other questions for, for Patricia on the finance side of how this all works? All right, quiet group today. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think um, that is, that's our presentation today. Um, I was gonna just give you a heads up on a couple of things um, that aren't on the agenda, just they've come up more recently. Um, so our, we've received a, a notice from the GSA about needing to amend our federal lease uh, and there's some language in there that would then make us, uh, it uh, would align us as a contractor for the federal government, which would mean that anyone that works at the airport could potentially be required to um, have the COVID vaccine. Um, and so we have very little information about this. I, we have a call coming up tomorrow where this should be outlined for us um, of what this will look like, but that appears to be the function that the federal government will be using is are these lease agreements, um, which we do have lease agreements with the federal government, both the FAA and the TSA. And so um, that appears how they are planning to make us be considered contractors of the federal government. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we will learn more tomorrow. Um, the other thing is uh, our crosswalk over to the economy lot um, is now a true crosswalk. We, we have all of the safety infrastructure in place. We don't have a shuttle running there any longer. And we knew that this would be um, not popular with <laughs> some folks, um, just like any change. Uh, people don't necessarily like change. Um, the, that economy lot was really never intended to have a shuttle running. Um, I've done a, a pretty extensive looking around at other airports uh, of our size with similar economy lot configurations. No one has a shuttle running. It was costing us $12,000 a month, um, but we needed to open that economy lot because of uh, our fast um, recovery in our passenger numbers. So now that the crosswalk's in place, um, it's a little bit longer walk. I can tell you it is it is not a longer walk than going from the new concourse A to concourse B at Salt Lake City. Um, that's a good that's a good 15 minute walk right there. Um, but in case you hear you know complaining out in the community, uh, the reason that we are no longer doing that is because a it wasn't intended. Um, B it is an economy lot, so you're you're choosing to get a little less, um, you know, have to pay a little less for parking, but the, the um, offset is that you walk a little bit further. Um, and also we just, along with the $12,000 a month, we just needed to stop having greenhouse gas emissions with a ban that went around and around and around um, about 20 hours a day. So those are all the reasons. Um, I don't know if you have all heard any, any you know, rumblings out there, but um, in case you do, but now you have the information. All right. So, Patrick, I think we are back to you for uh, discussion questions, comments, and open to the floor. Thank you, Catherine. And before we get there, before I forget, let me congratulate you on the 2021 Airport Manager of the Year Award. Very well deserved. Thank you. I think I'm speaking Thank you so much. That was a nice surprise. Yeah, very, very glad we, we have you here in Eugene. Um, 
Does anybody else have any comments or any questions? No, hearing none, I guess our meeting is adjourned. Uh, Catherine and Andrew, if you have a couple of minutes, I'd like to talk to you guys about the World Championships uh, um, at the end of this meeting. All right, sounds good. Great. Very nice to see everybody. Have a great rest of your week.